An American Carol is a 2008 comedy from writer, director, and producer David Zucker, the man behind such beloved films as Airplane and The Naked Gun. Added to his canon of classic, slapstick, pun-based comedy is the film we're about to discuss today, a so-called parody of A Christmas Carol by none other than Miss Charles Dickens. Zucker and his ragtag group of Hollywood right-wingers try to make conservatives actually laugh at something for once. Will they succeed? Unfortunately, there's only one way to find out. Thank you, boys. They're women. Greetings, my good bitches. The name's Francis, Coke Francis. I'm a filmmaker, stand-up comedian, drag artist, and I'm here because I have to put my film degree to some kind of use. As a mediocre comedian living in Los Angeles, I hear this question asked frequently. Why aren't there more conservative comedians? Great question, actually. Why aren't there? The right does have a handful of distinguished top-notch comedians, like this brilliant gentleman here. Can I help you? <laughs> I love me, praise. <laughs> he has blessed this day. Truly, he has. Maybe he could have been great if Amy Schumer hadn't read him to filth on Fox News. You slip by the, the dirty comedian thing, but honestly, you call yourself a comedian, but you don't do it that much. Like, I go fishing a couple times a year, but I don't introduce myself on TV as a fisherman. Wow. Poor fella never bounced back from that. If your top representative makes Amy Schumer look good by comparison, then right-wing comedy needs a major makeover. But never fear, the right also has Dennis Miller, who's so old he can remember when Dennis Miller used to be funny. Producers have put me up over here in a uh, green hotel. You've heard that term, I never knew what that meant. Now that I'm staying in one, I realize it's a hotel that makes you envious of people staying in a good hotel. The only thing about Dennis Miller that's gotten funnier over time is a portrait of him in his attic. And who could forget the time that Ann Coulter showed up to the roast of Rob Lowe to promote her book and showed the comedy world her true abilities as a media personality. I once thought Pete Davidson was just like Obama, biracial goofball who ruined a once beloved institution, but it turns out I was wrong. Pete's not biracial. <laughs> Good one. And now the comedy world and entertainment in general has historically leaned left, but why does it have to be that way? Full disclosure, this might surprise some of you, but I'm pretty far left. However, I absolutely love making fun of myself, my politics, and the left in general. And believe you me, there are plenty of liberal comedians who make me want to throw the souls of orphans into swimming pools of piss. The best examples of liberal satire I've seen are in most Matt Stone and Trey Parker projects. We see it constantly in South Park, especially in recent seasons. Did you just say spokesman instead of spokesperson? When women are just as capable of selling sandwiches as anyone? Are you purposely trying to use words that assert your male privilege? No, I'm sorry, I was just trying to frame you for raping butters. Team America was the pinnacle of American satire, as well as one of my favorite films of all time, which had funny and valid critiques of both the left and the right. Let me explain to you how this works. You see, the corporations finance Team America, and then Team America goes out, and the corporations sit there in their, in their corporation buildings, and, and, and see, that they're, they're all corporation-y, and they make money. Even Portlandia managed to skewer some of the liberal ideology that permeates its titular city. We have classes here. Abby D's queer question, why don't you take that? Mm -hmm. I have pole dancing class that day. Excuse me? You have pole dancing? Class? Pole dancing? Exercise? We're Good. about to freak out right now. There is a gold mine of material here. And as a leftist, bisexual, non-binary, Jewish drag queen comedian, I demand more jokes be made at my expense. So we're about to find out if Mr. Zucker has finally provided us with a funny and insightful view of conservative politics in an American carol. I've got high hopes. Even Divine's fucking over this shit. Before we begin, I just want to clarify that in no way am I an expert in politics or comedy or anything, really. This video is purely for entertainment purposes and in no way am I trying to push an agenda on any of you. All viewers along the political spectrum are welcome here. Unless you're a Nazi, in which case, go fuck yourself. But also, I don't know what you're doing here on a drag queen's channel. 
If you do get offended, please remember that this is all in good fun. I do my best to punch up, not down. That's actually what this is mostly an exploration of. So let's get started. Okay, so we open on this suburban barbecue boomer's wet dream on 4th of July, where we see a bunch of white people who peaked in middle school, and Leslie Nielsen playing your least favorite grandpa who doesn't understand Cards Against Humanity and probably still uses the term Orientals. Anyway, his grandkids ask him to tell them a story, and rather than making up something fun, he decides to tell them one from the vaults. Really? The guy who hated Christmas? Yep, that old chestnut. But this is a new type of Scrooge, a type that hates 4th of July. But Grandpa Leslie takes us on a journey that begins in Afghanistan, and nothing could possibly go wrong here, right? Mohammed. <laughs> Get it? Because they all have the same name? I must remember to use last names. <laughs> and the hilarity ensues. This whole scene is super bizarre because it has the comedic timing and delivery of other Zucker films, but it just comes off as super racist. I don't know, maybe this was funny by 2008 standards? Okay, get ready guys. I'm about to make comedy boring again. The key to offensive humor is making sure that the victim is never the butt of the joke. Jim Jeffries' joke about Bill Cosby is a perfect example of this. It turns out that Bill Cosby is a rapist. <laughs> I know, I always used to watch him on the telly as a kid, and I always used to think to myself, ah, I bet he doesn't rape. But <laughs> I've been wrong before, and I'll be wrong again. The reason it works is because the butt of the joke is Bill Cosby and his sympathizers, not the rape victims themselves. Team America's jokes work because the butt of the joke is American ignorance and the way that the average American views the Middle East, not Middle Easterners themselves. Here, Middle Eastern people are the butt of the joke, so even though it technically works structurally, it just comes off as super racist. Uh, so then they do this parody of, I guess, Goofus and Gallant from Highlights magazine. Here are Ahmed and Aman. Ahmed knows punctuality is important. He makes sure to leave plenty of time to get to his bombing site. That's the gun Aman leaves everything to the last minute. Oh, shit. What bothers me the most about this is that it actually has the potential to be funny, but again, remember who the butt of the joke is. Like, if this was some kind of training video made by Americans and they were showing it to other Americans, I don't know, something like that. I don't know, I love offensive humor and this was supposed to make me laugh and it didn't. So... So at the expense of big old bad Hollywood liberals who want to ruin America, the three terrorists decide to enlist the help of a documentary filmmaker named Michael Malone, who is a pretty ham-fisted parody of Michael Moore. He's played by Kevin Farley, the Jeb Bush of the Farley family. And he's in Cuba talking about how great their healthcare system is, which I guess is a reference to Sicko, but they wouldn't be making a joke about that four years late, right? Right? As you'll soon find out, the overarching theme of this movie is that if you have any ideas on how to make America better, it means you hate America. She can dish it, but she can't take it. See, so many people wanted to thank me, they rushed the boat. They wouldn't let me leave. These people know how bad it's gotten in America. So this part's really interesting because it could have been a valid critique on neoliberals and their refusal to give up anything that might affect their comfort, including basic human rights. The problem here is that it's done for all the wrong reasons. They thought everybody loved his movies. Hmm. This Sunday, we're gonna abolish July 4th. Because, you know, that's a part of the liberal agenda that's super accurate and everyone knows about. Fuck, they found us out! Take three chocolate mints, three fudge... Oh yes, fat jokes. Break out the Jaeger, guys. Do a shot for every fat joke this movie makes, and soon your liver will look just like Kevin Farley. This is a good matter, Spatch. Oh! For being respectful to a fat, ignorant, traitorous sack of shit. But don't worry, this girl was actually just Grandpa Leslie going off on another senile rant that probably would have ended with him saying something about the blacks had the kids not cut him off. 
We are on a roll, people. This rally will be historic. Most important since Nixon. The biggest problem with this aspect of the plot, and it's a big part of the plot, is that there is... No truth to it! Nobody gives a fuck about whether Independence Day exists or not, except for the filmmakers and their like-minded people. And because there's no truth or accuracy, there's no opportunity for real satire. So now we got a nice cameo from Travis Schult, also known as Ben the Soldier in Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And here he's playing Michael's nephew, Josh. Why should I celebrate a country that's caused oppression and terror all over the world? Yeah, why should we? Is that how he felt? He was a war hero. PT-109. He would have come around. Oh, I bet he'd be coming a lot more than that. The F in John F. Kennedy stands for fuck machine. Lee and I just... Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna start a fat joke counter right here. Here's number two. I'm shipping out to the Persian Gulf Sunday night. Well, can't you get out of it? I want to go. It's my duty. Okay, so notice how dead-ass serious Josh is when he says this line. This is a recurring issue in the movie. It takes itself so seriously. If you're doing comedy, take your work seriously, but not yourself. Again, if you can dish it, you better be able to take it. Nobody likes it. Take yourself seriously, Sally. This is like a pure flicks movie, except instead of God, it's America. And it's from the guy who shot this scene. <laughs> So Michael visits his agent, who's played by James Woods, who's best known for playing himself on Family Guy. Ooh, a piece of candy. Ooh, a piece of candy. Ooh, a piece of candy. And no one wants to see Americans screwed by foreigners except in porn. This actually isn't a bad line. First extremely mild chuckle after 14 minutes in a David Zucker movie. Porn? I haven't done porn in years! After the first funny line in this movie, it's then followed up by another painfully unfunny line from Michael that was about as necessary as Anne Frank's drum kit. So next is the Move Along Film Awards, where they decide to drag our Queen Paris into this. No, wait. She probably made the decision herself. God damn it. Lenny Riefenstahl celebrated the incredible rise of Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler. Her pioneering use of the wide-angle lens to capture the scope of massive formations paved the way for succeeding generations of filmmakers. I'm cringing so hard, I got scoliosis. I love how this has absolutely no tie-in, comedically or accurately, to award shows or liberal politics in general. And no, I'm not offended by the subject matter at all. Let's take a look at one of my favorite musicals of all time, The Producers. I was born in Dusseldorf, and that is why they call me Wolf. Don't be stupid, be a smarty. Come and join the Nazi party. This worked for a number of different reasons, mostly because it's another example of who the butt of the joke should be. Here, Hitler is the butt of the joke, and there's no better way to rob somebody of power than through mockery and laughter. That's what satire fucking is. I'm not quite sure who the butt of the joke is here, because I can't find a joke anywhere. It's like watching your 15-year-old edgelord cousin who just learned how to swear tell jokes at Thanksgiving. It's pure shock value just masquerading as comedy. And this year's award for best documentary director goes to Michael Malone for Die, You American Pig. This is Michael Malone's third Move Along documentary award. So accurate, am I right, guys? Like, Michael Moore's original movie was called Sicko, but I think this is a much more accurate representation. He's then rushed off stage for no reason. I mean, the whole reason he's at this ceremony is because he's presumably well-liked by everyone, and he just won an award for saying the same thing. Make it make sense, movie! George Mulroney for that McCarthy sure was bad. Imagine actually thinking that McCarthyism is cool. Sup, bro, Tendo. You know, the establishment knows what's best for us. Hey, did you catch that new hippity hoppity record that just came out? Or like slavery or Nazism, even though they ended too. That aged like fine wine.
So now he's at a post-show party and he's approached by our lovable Three Stooges terrorist guys who ask Michael to... Direct a movie to inspire the final jihad. Oh. And this scene is just chock full of clever racist jokes that age super well and really keep you on your toes. Ooh, crab cake. Hey! So the trio tells Michael that they have $10 million to make a movie through a series of more jokes that make absolutely no sense until Michael gets distracted by a pair of titties. At this point, my dick is softer than a paper straw in a five-day-old Jamba Juice smoothie. Whatever happened to Michael Malone? Huh? The beefy filmmaker is trying to get a new movie huh? off the ground after the news today that his latest movie tanked. He literally just won an award for it. This movie is literally saying, Oh what, your movies win awards and are admired by people? Keep it up, loser. But Michael meets up with a couple of the terrorists to discuss the film they want to make because Michael made some documentaries and therefore hates America. Taliban love story. Boy meets girl, boy falls in love with girl, boy cuts girl's head off. But it's going to be my script. Dramatic story about how one courageous man took on the system. Here's another example of a joke that could have been turned into a valid critique of the whole white savior complex that neoliberals frequently express, but instead it's based off false claims and done for all the wrong reasons. Bitch, please. These filmmakers worship white everything. You gonna finish that? So Michael's chilling in bed watching a thing about John Fuck Machine Kennedy, and he seems to really vibe with it. Then in a strange Oliver Stone remake of The Ring, Kennedy addresses Michael directly and comes out of the TV. He then tells Michael that he needs to redeem himself and change his views on war in this movie's signature dead-ass serious tone. You sound like Ronald Reagan. Thank you. You know who kept it real, bros of Stalin? The guy who consulted an astrologist to guide his political decisions while millions of people died of AIDS. You're not gonna eat that, are you? And with that, President Pap's powered plow machine tells Michael he'll be visited by three ghosts of America's past that night. Boom, you just got Jacob Marleyed. So Michael goes to Columbia University, where people are protesting all sorts of outdated shit that conservatives love, and have absolutely nothing to do with this plot or real life. There is nothing more important than stopping war! No more war! No because, more war! Because instead of fighting, we should talk to our enemy! Stop, don't fight! Stop, don't fight! Right. Get it? Because they're sheep? This is yet another missed opportunity for valid liberal critiques. There are plenty of holier-than-thou progressive college kids who have no idea what they're talking about and still act high and mighty about it. They could have referenced something real and accurate. You're sad that people are mean? Well, I'm sorry, the world isn't one big liberal arts college campus! But no, instead we get the movie equivalent of Rush Limbaugh on a skateboard. Michael then gets trampled, but is soon saved by... Hey baby, I hear the blues are calling, toss out... Kelsey Grammer? He's playing the ghost of General Patton, one of the three ghosts the fuck machine warned Michael about. I can't explain why, but there's something about Kelsey Grammer that just makes my asshole slam shut. Germany, September 1938. That's Neville Chamberlain weak-ass Prime Minister of England. And who was Neville Chamberlain associated with? Let's see... You know, the ones known as Tories. The ones that were loyal to Britain and fought against the Americans in the Revolutionary War. The war that celebrates... Fourth of July. Yep! There! How's that? You missed a spot. Hey! The leader of the conservative party shining Hitler's shoes is not only the biggest self-own, but also the only accurate part of this whole movie. And we'll name a concentration camp after Camp Auschwitz. <laughs> That's not even clever. Even B. Larry King was a more creative nickname than that. You're not Mel Brooks. Stop pretending you are. You're not! You're not! Okay, so I'm going to attempt to make sense of this next scene, which is actually giving me stage four colon cancer. Thoughts and prayers are readily accepted. So Michael and Patton travel to a big plantation in Alabama in present day, and according to this movie, this is the world that would exist if Lincoln had never started the Civil War. He didn't. 
and therefore slavery would still exist if Lincoln had never started a war that he never actually started. <coughs> Matthew Malone! Matthew Malone! I had the boys polish up your trophies like you told us. Obviously, I can't speak on behalf of a race of people I'm not a part of, but how did they get black people to be in this movie? Did Candace Owens finance this? Is Candace Owens a thing in 2008? I don't care. You know what? They don't care about facts, neither do I. Fuck them. You know this isn't real, right? You're right. It isn't real. Hundreds of people worked on and starred in this movie without doing a single second of research before making it. These are the kids in high school who would brag about not studying for tests. Maybe this scene could have worked. Maybe. If Michael was one of those people who was like, oh, slavery ended forever ago, why can't they just get over it? And then the flashback could reveal that his ancestors were slave owners, therefore showing the error of his ways, blah, 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 but... Or like slavery or Nazism, even though they ended too. The problem is that the filmmakers are the people who tell black people to get over slavery. And once again, this fails as a satire because, as we stated before, it needs to be based in fact, and there is literally none of that here. Am I missing something? Whatever. The cancer is making its way to my lungs, and we must move on as soon as possible. A liberal film director who can't even get laid at the Columbia University Peace Studies Department. Oh shit, Abraham Lincoln. You're 40-something and you won't even fuck your potentially underage college students? Loser. Am I right? Am I right, guys? They go to your movies because their professors tell them to. Interesting considering Rush Limbaugh and Bill O'Reilly told their loyal fans to see this movie. And so did the advisor for a conservative college club. While we're here, let's take a look at my notes again. Oops. As a musical theater fan and participant, I don't have the time or the energy for this musical number explaining how education automatically means indoctrination, and neither do you. Skit! So then we go back in time where we meet Michael's long-lost love before he went off to film school, and even though she said she'd wait, she, get this, didn't wait after all. And instead she falls for a smashing young man who looks like the leader of the Hitler Youth. You got drafted! No, Michael, I enlisted. I want to serve my country. Whatever, Narc. He is kind of hot, though. Gross. Then they completely undermine the whole point they're trying to make in this scene by implying that Molly went on to bang every party city model this side of Wisconsin. When she said she loves a man in uniform, apparently she meant any man in any uniform. But either way, she marries sexy Hitler and Michael is left in the dust. Okay, everybody, we have a great guest here today to make a cameo in this film, and I just have a feeling he's gonna turn this great movie into a fantastic one. Let's see who it is. Hi, I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching. Tonight's spe The doctors have done everything they could, but the cancer has spread to my brain. My dying wish is to complete this analysis. Michael Malone is planning a demonstration to abolish the 4th of July. Why does Bill O'Reilly look like a deflated blow-up doll of Bill Maher? Also featured here is another ham-fisted parody, this time of Rosie O'Donnell, who makes perfectly reasonable points this whole scene and this is supposed to be funny somehow. I bet some of you in the comments are all, Oh, if they were saying conservative talking points, you'd think that was really funny. Quite the contrary, actually. I only laugh at funny things, and this is just proving that conservatives aren't funny. The civilized world braces itself. Praise Jesus! Bethany two virgins, here I come! This is another scene that has huge potential for comedy. The gags themselves are funny, and even the idea itself is really funny. And I love the insert with the toy bus being blown apart. The problem is that they're not poking fun at Christianity or anyone. Instead, they're just making jokes at the expense of Muslims. Of course, they're gonna argue that, oh, but we're the ones being blown apart by Muslims. We're the victims. Sure, Jan. When you're constantly discriminated against and persecuted for your religious beliefs, give us a call or write it in the comments. Whether you like it or not, we have freedom of speech in this beautiful country. 
my god! Ma'am, if you had extra bleach, you might have a shot of getting those stains out. The filmmakers think menstruation is shameful because it's a reminder that women don't solely exist to breed more of their ugly children. So now two of our lovable terrorists are holding auditions for this movie they want Michael to make. This is so much better than building pipe bombs. Zing! Then Grandpa Leslie bursts in doing an absolutely dead-on impersonation of a Middle Eastern person. Thankfully, a grammar ex machina shows up to tell Michael they're under attack, and they square off with the ACLU, who are zombies? Because they believe in equal rights? Am I, am I missing something? I don't- I don't have a joke here. I don't get it. I don't- I don't understand. I don't understand. Also, shout out to the legendary Dennis Hopper in his final film appearance before he passed away. Going out on a high note. I am prepared to kill myself. It seems this prepubescent comedy is preoccupied with preaching presumptuous misogyny. Kelsey Grammer really did go to the Derek Chauvin school of being fucking racist. <laughs> you know what, I'm actually just gonna... <laughs> but Michael actually wakes up at the 4th of July barbecue with Grandpa Leslie. Hey, do I smell burgers? What I think I'm gonna miss most is your cooking. Not my kisses. <laughs> <laughs> Straight people are gross. Anyway, Michael's in the part of A Christmas Carol where he sees his family and their sick kid, the tiny Tim of this story, and his name is... Timmy. That lord asshole only loves himself. And all these ugly kids hate Michael because he didn't come up with enough money for their random operations because, again, documentaries don't make a lot of money even though his film is just awarded a... So then they take a trip to Afghanistan where the people recognize Michael from his latest documentary, even though according to this movie, nobody watches documentaries. He's much faster in person. Mercy upon me, oh God, according to that love. Praise be I keep expecting the scene to turn into like a Monty Python thing. No? Just more dead ass serious seriousness? Comedy! I have done my best. This challenge was just too much. So now you're telling God? You are hopeless. Michael just saw you speak to literally nobody inside of a church. How dare he make assumptions the way this movie has been making assumptions about liberals for 56 minutes. Apparently his father was George Washington for some reason. Anyway, let's hear what John Voight has to say. Like freedom of speech, which you abuse. Like freedom of religion. This is St. Paul's Chapel. You know. All the things this movie has been complaining about since the first five seconds. Oh my god. It was the World Trade Center. And this is the dust of 3,000 innocent human beings and the great heroes who perished trying to save them. Say what you want about an American Carol, but they certainly made a movie that we'll never forget. So Michael then stumbles into a graveyard and happens to find a headstone with his name on it. His birthday is on 420. Cute. And Trace Adkins shows up. Apparently, he's the angel of death in this universe. So the three ghosts of America are General Patton, George Washington, and Trace Adkins. Okay. And because of Michael's films, we lost the war on terror, and the terrorists have taken over Hollywood, even though, again, according to this movie, Michael makes documentaries, which nobody watches or sees or pays money to see but movie's got a straw man for straw man's sake. Trace then whisks Michael to his hometown of Detroit, which has just been bombed, and the only thing left is... Some big ass celebrity. Jenna Jameson's tits! Oh God, what have we done? <laughs> this whole bit with them playing with the fake ass could have actually been funny had Michael been a terrible person with a terrible impact, but there's literally no way his films could have this kind of reach because again, According to this movie, nobody watches documentaries. Now they're just copying exactly what I did after Rush Limbaugh croaked, so maybe we're both guilty. But Michael finally wakes up in the comfort of his own bed where he sees his anti-4th of July protest happening on TV. Time to go. This might be the most out-of-touch boomer movie that ever boomered. Anyway, he shows up and gives our terrorist buddies their media passes so they can blow up the Trace Adkins concert. About fucking time. And in this really bad remake of a super hot gay porno I saw one time, 
Michael is confronted by Kelsey, the Billmar pool toy, and the fuck machine so they can give him a pep talk and help him save the day. So Michael makes a passionate speech in front of his base where he clarifies that healthcare and global warming are only second to ensuring everyone knows that we do, in fact, live in an English-speaking nation. But he's quickly tomatoed off the stage and rescued by more military hunks. I have a type, don't I? He's then ushered into the Trace Adkins concert that the three terrorists were supposed to blow up, but instead they spill the beans that their leader isn't really an actor. He's actually a terrorist. <laughs> Who can still get down with Whitey? They realize the bomb they set up is about to detonate in three minutes, so the two other terrorists try to help defuse it? Because they had a change of heart? I guess. Stalin. Inventor of Velcro. Oh. Boy, they're really giving Family Guy and Deadpool a run for their money in the referential humor department. Anyway, Michael takes the stage and shows the crowd how much he's changed, blah blah blah, but finds a way to out the lead terrorist who does not even make an attempt to be stealth in this super important mission he's been talking about for 70 minutes. I've never done this in a public restroom. Don't worry about it. Just relax and pull it gently. Like that? Oh. And faster than you can make a super original gay sex joke almost directly lifted from Austin Powers, the two other terrorists find a way to defuse the bomb and save the day. Welcome to the real America. This is the greatest country in the whole wide world. This is why we need to bring back bullying. Wait, aren't those turncoats? You know. The guys who lost the Revolutionary War, the one y'all are celebrating today, they're the real America too. But Michael realizes there's one more thing he has to do. Visit Bob Cratchit. I mean, Josh, I mean, Ben the Sol- Never mind. Uncle Asshole. It turns out the only reason this kid was on crutches is because he was trying to carry this film. This actually could have been a really touching scene, and it kind of is, but for all the wrong reasons. If Michael had been an asshole to Josh regardless of whether or not he was in the military, this change of heart would be purely through emotion and empathy, showing that Michael changed as a person and Josh forgave him. But here, it's just because of a change in political views, which just cheapens the whole thing. Empathy is possible, as long as we both vote for Bush. This time I know our side will win. Whatever, narc. Then Zucker attempts to revive the slapstick charm of his older works that ends up looking like a ripoff of Epic Movie. So Kelsey shows up again and he and Michael have a cute little dialogue as they walk away best buddies. And finally, after 75 very long minutes, Michael dedicates his film career to movies starring dead people. This is the same guy who played the JFK earlier, no? They didn't get a different actor? Is Michael the only one who can see him? Is Michael insane? Are the terrorists insane? These are questions I have. God bless us everyone. And God, God bless, bless America. America. God bless America. It's done. We made it. Okay. So there's that. Let's get down and nerdy and talk about it. All political biases aside, an American Carol just isn't funny. The beauty of classic David Zucker's So Stupid It's Funny comedy was that it was never meant to be political satire. It parodied other movies with rapid fire jokes and perfectly timed slapstick comedy. Airplane and Top Secret and Naked Gun didn't have an agenda or a message. They were simply there to entertain and that's why they succeeded. Unfortunately, being entertaining was not a priority here and this brand of humor just doesn't translate well to politics. This movie doesn't offend me as a leftist. I'm actually way more offended on behalf of conservatives. I have conservative friends who are way smarter than I am, and I'm sorry this movie thinks they're dumb enough to find this funny or accurate. Obviously, there are plenty who do, but I do not associate with them. I don't associate with unfunny people. There's nothing cringier than watching someone who thinks they're hilarious also take themselves way too seriously. Rather than poking fun at itself, an American Carol just barrels through with the we're right, you're wrong mentality, which is dishonest, alienating, and above all, cringy as fuck. 
The original title of An American Carol, and its international title, was actually called Big Fat Important Movie, which is actually a funny title. It's self-aware and takes a loving jab at itself, but nope. Apparently, that was too offensive for the people who love to call me a snowflake. The film labels itself as satire. The problem is that satire is based in truth and is inherently anti-establishment. It punches up! As political scientist Alison Dagnus states, Conservatism supports institutions, and satire aims to knock these institutions down a peg. Not only is there little to no truth in Zucker's jabs against the liberal agenda, but conservatism is inherently pro-establishment. This renders any attempt at satire useless. These people genuinely think it's super cool to support these institutions that are universally mocked in other better examples of satire. And they genuinely think they're really funny. And boy, is this just sad! Also, there's plenty to make fun of about Michael Moore, even if you do like his movies. Why not make fun of some of the actual issues people have with him? Homeboy joined the NRA right after the Columbine Massacre because he thought he could take it down from the inside. Sure, Jan. He also shits on everything responsible for making him a multi-millionaire. The only accurate thing about him portrayed here is that he's fat, which is apparently super funny. 13 times. The only somewhat solid argument this movie suggests is that the liberal attitude towards war is everyone be nice to everyone and this will all go away, which is bullshit. Conflict is inevitable. The only consistent things throughout human history are fighting and fucking. But Zucker refuses to acknowledge that the war hawking and Islamophobia this movie gets a huge boner off of are also bullshit. The real solution, as it is with most issues, is way more complicated. I don't know it, you don't know it, these filmmakers certainly don't fucking know it, but they act like they do. What could have been a comedy is turned into propaganda that pushes a specific agenda. Let's reference our boys in Team America again. As actors, it is our responsibility to read the newspapers and then say what we read on television like it's our own opinion. Matt Damon. Stone and Parker had the balls to call out these self-important liberal celebrities who love to act like they know what's best for everyone else, and who would go on TV to talk about the war in Iraq as if they were political experts. The difference between that and an American Carol lies in the bias. Team America is nonpartisan and equally critical of both sides of the political spectrum, but this movie wouldn't dare mock those they generally agree with. Yeah. You're a butt-fucking quitter! It turns what could be satire into one big conservative circle jerk. So, let's discuss. Can conservatives be funny? The answer is, technically, yes, anybody can be funny regardless of political beliefs. But it's crucial to not take yourself seriously, otherwise you end up with a hot mess like this one. Anyway, I'm gonna go rewatch Airplane, even though it makes me sad now. Sad and Airplane do not belong in the same sentence. That is fucked up if you ask me. An American Carol is free on Amazon Prime. Not that I'm recommending it, it's more of just a I saw it, now you have to see it too trauma kind of thing. Once again, just to cover my ass, these opinions are entirely my own and I'm not trying to force anything down your throat unlike this movie. Let me know your thoughts on it. Maybe you found it funny. If so, more power to you. But hey, what do I know? I'm just some unknown drag queen in a bedroom. Either way, thank you for sitting through this with me, and if you'd like to help me overcome my newly developed cancer, please do me a favor and dick slap those like and subscribe buttons as hard as you can. Until next time, howdy.